Welcome to Massive Late Fee. And now your hosts, Mark and Carol. Well, hello everyone. Welcome back to Massive Late Fee. My name is Mark. With me as always is my girlfriend, Carol. How are you doing, Carol? Hey, what's up? Is that how we start the show? I, I forget now. Seriously? Yeah. Today it's been is, that long? Today is March the 3rd. 1995 and we are here in the basements we're back as we <laughs> mentioned on 90210 if you listen to 90210 we said we're back which if you're not listening to 90210 then you're missing out yeah. you're missing out on some really really good and really really bad stuff absolutely <laughs> I mean, it gets better, but oh my god, some of these season one episodes are not good. Oh, man. We had Matthew Perry in the last episode, though. Yeah, I liked that one. Seriously, check out, check it out if you if you want to check it out. If you want to be checked out, check it out with the checking on. If you want to be checked out, yeah. I'll check you out. Okay. Uh, anyway, so, no news today because... We've been on vacation, as we yes, stated we in the other thing. We went to Florida. Working on the tan. Bernie, let's go to Florida. <laughs> Are you an old Jewish woman? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I just got to get, went to Switzerland and I, Zurich, and I got a surgery. So now I'm an old Jewish woman. Aw, but, but I liked that. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a joke, guys. I'm, I'm still all man. <laughs> but anyway, so I haven't had a chance to look at the paper or do any of that stuff. So, no news. No, there's some news. There's some really freaking sad news and angering news. Oh, I think I know what you're talking about. <sighs> the groundhog saw his shadow. No. Oh. <laughs> what was it then? My so-called life mm. is canceled. My so-called show is no longer a show. I, I'm, like, heartbroken. Like, I, I'm sorry, by the way, that it took us so long. Like, we only have one episode left that, like, we knew that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we thought we'd come back from vacation to a slew of new uh, My So-Called Life episodes right? that we could run through the summer and everything. Yeah, we, we even, like, set up the frickin' VCR to record it. You know mm-hmm. how hard that is to do? Right. But we took the time. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it wasn't... There. Thanks, ABC. We hate you, ABC. I really loved that rerun of uh, Home Improvement that <laughs> we saw <sighs> instead. Oh, my God. I mean, I'm telling you, it was such a great show. And unfortunately now, I, I'm telling you, they're they're so young. They're teenagers. We're never going to see, you know, Claire Dana's or, uh, <laughs> or Jared Leto ever again, I'm sure. Yeah. And mm. poor Rayanne and Ricky. And- I just want to know what happened. I want to know what happened. First of all, it's a fantastic show. Well, there's a little thing called ratings. But and they didn't get it. Who was not watching the show? Most and, of and, America, apparently. And if you weren't, then shame on you. Agreed. You should be listening to our show and then watching the things that we watch. Yes. That's and you should works. know. Just psychically ahead of time because we almost never tell you exactly what we're going to watch. Yeah. <laughs> Just read our minds. Well, they knew we were watching. They did know we were my watching. So-called my so-called life. life. That means that, like, you know, lots of people probably weren't even listening to our tapes if they weren't watching the show. That joke is retired now, Sad. Too. What? What joke? My so-called life. <gasps> no. I know. Oh, it's not right. So I guess. Do you we think will Claire Dana's will be another another stuff? Because now, I mean, I'm being a little tongue in cheek when I say that she's not going to be in anything else because she was in Little Women. Yeah, and she was good in that. And she was good in this. I I don't know. I think we'll probably see her again. I think that Jared Leto's gone though. Yeah, I Jordan mean Jordan Catalan. Who he he's like super cute, but. I mean, I'm not that impressed with his acting ability. No, there's not, there's not much there. I mean... It's not necessarily his fault. They don't give his character a lot to do. He certainly doesn't seem very method, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> Maybe he should try singing. He was in a band in the show. Yeah. Anyway, so... 
moving on, uh, I guess, I guess, since we don't really have any news, we should talk about the what you know apparently is the final episode oh. of my so-called life. Not even we don't even get a Saved by the Bell style movie to uh, to tie things up. There's just no resolution, none. Prepare yourselves for disappointment. Yeah. Uh, well, whenever you listen to this show, you should prepare yourself for disappointment. <laughs> That's <is> true. <sighs> okay. So, remind me. Okay. We watched, it's, it's been called a while. My So-Called Life. Well, I mean, it's been a couple weeks since we watched it. Um, it started out with uh, Angela saying things. To it always people. starts out with Angela saying things. She, uh, I'm trying to think. The dad is upset because they're oh. doing the restaurant, and yeah, the investors, the investors don't want him. They, they're like, "Well, we'll invest with the rest. We'll invest in the restaurant, but not with this fucker as the chef." Yeah, because, and I was thinking, like, I'm like, "What the? Why? Like, I? Why would you even?" consider investing in a restaurant if you don't like the chef but apparently and i guess this makes sense he has no experience in uh cooking he has no you know he's, he's never cooked in a restaurant before he has no experience at all basically uh remember that he liked to cook at home he went to take a cooking class from a very famous uh, chef who turned out to be an alcoholic that right. <laughs> uh, that basically dropped out of the class. And then he started teaching the class, and that's where all this came from. So, yeah, he's self-taught, but he really has no experience of being a chef. So it makes sense where investors would be like, we're not putting money into a fucking restaurant where the chef's never cooked before. I wonder if the the girl that he's doing this with has any experience in any of it either. It seemed like more like Brad... Yeah. Was like the money man and possibly the idea man, idea man? I think she's good at talking and kind of like design, basically. So like the design of the the restaurant. And I think that's kind of what she sold them on. Like Brad uh, hooked them up together, but that's kind of what sold that. You know, that's what she sold them on. But, you know, basically it comes down to the dad's like, look, I'll fucking cook for him because that the proof is in the, the figgy pudding. But, but here's the thing, okay? It was him and his wife, and yeah. what is this lady's name? I can't remember her name right now, but the uh, restaurant lady. S- Whatever. S- the Angela. girl that wants to sleep with him. Angela. <laughs> no, that's his daughter. Um, Ricky. Um, okay, now you're just being ridiculous. okay? <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of her name. Uh, Cheryl? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's it. I don't know. Um... Okay, so she is talking to the mom right, and telling her about what's going on. Mm-hmm. She's like, but, you know, the proof's in his cooking. All he has to do is cook for them, and I know it'll change their minds. Right. And then he walks in and rants and decides, I'm just going to cook for them. And, and she, like, lets him think that it's his idea. Mm-hmm. And the whole way that is going down just looks like they're a couple. For sure, yes. And... You can see how uncomfortable his wife is. Oh, she's not happy. Yeah. Deborah or whatever her name is. Her name is not Deborah. I don't remember her name. Graham and... Is it Graham or Grant? No, he's Graham for sure. Graham. What the hell is her name? Summer. (laughs) Angela Chase, Graham Chase. I've never thought of his name that way. Yeah. It's weird. Uh, Betsy, Betty, Brianna. (laughs) No. I, I guess it doesn't matter anymore. No, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter anymore because they're gone. But that's, I mean, that's basically, like, where it leaves off, like, with them. I mean, yeah, they, the mom, oh, the mom gets the idea that she's going to call her ex-boyfriend. <laughs> yeah, because he's got restaurant experience. Yeah, he's in the restaurant business, and she's going to call and get advice from him mm-hmm. for them. This is her way of contributing, but also her way of maybe getting a little revenge. Yep. And he doesn't care. Not at first. Her husband. Well, no, he never cares. Okay. It, it's just the, the one girl tells him to act like it. She does? Yeah. I don't remember that. Yeah. He was talking about how his wife is, um, you know, having her ex-boyfriend talk to her or whatever. And um, she said, are you jealous? And he said, 
He said, no. Should I be? And she's like, it wouldn't hurt you to act like it. She gave him that. Oh. And so that's why then he later did act like it. Wow. But it was all it was all a show. Oh, wow. I missed that. Yeah. Which that sucks, too, that like he doesn't think that. I mean, that's a threatening situation. He was leaving her alone with the boyfriend Mm -hmm. and taking their daughters with him to Mm -hmm. this cooking thing for the investors. So he was leaving them alone in the house. He might as well have fluffed the pillows in the bed. Right. And left some condoms like on the dresser. And just acted like, la, 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 no big deal. Mm-hmm. But when he was supposed to show up, somebody else showed up instead. Yeah, Jordan. Jordan Catalano. Right. <sighs> but anyway, so I guess to finish up that storyline real quick, the investors come, he cooks for them, and they're like, uh, oh, this is the shit. Let's, uh, we're going to invest our compliments to the chef and everyone fucking cheers. Like it's uh, a swim meet. I think he got a standing ovation. Yeah, it's so, it's really weird. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, so uh, that's going to work out well. And then they celebrate and then they almost kiss yep. him and that chick. And he's like, oh, I got to go home, you know, and he's going to rub one out or whatever. It's not good. I'm sure. I am sure that if the show were to continue, they would end oh, up fucking. Absolutely. Do you think that Patty... That's the wife's name, Patty. Patty, yeah, do Patty th- Mayonnaise. Do you think that they they would end up getting divorced? Um, yeah, I think they probably would have dealt with that. See, I think I they ca- would have dealt with the 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 uh, subject of divorce. Yes, I kind of feel like she would just forgive him if he didn't choose to leave her. I think she would just forgive him. I mean, maybe. It's their their relationship is so weird. When it starts out, it's like he's the one on the bottom, and it's like he always kind of like looked up to her, idolized her, or whatever. You know, like she was the popular one, he was the dork, all that kind of stuff. Right. And then really quickly, it, things changed. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, as soon as he got around people other than her. Yeah. Once he quit the job, the dynamic really shifted. Yeah, because when it started, she was his boss. Yeah, which is not a good position to be in. No. If you're the guy, you always want to be the boss of your 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 woman. Uh, excuse me? You don't want it to be the other way around. Hell no. Yeah, exactly. Hell no, you're No, correct. no, no. No, no. No, no, no. You just Are don't... you singing a song? <laughs> no, 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 no. You just don't want to work together, I would say. Or if you do, you want to be on the same level. No, it's okay if you're... It's okay if the guy's the boss. It is not. Yeah, it's kind of sexy if the guy's the boss and no. he can order the woman around and stuff. No. Like but the other way around, it's like women shouldn't be the bo- bosses anyway. I mean, honestly. Oh, my God. What? I- I'm reevaluating every decision I've made in my life up to this point. Okay. <laughs> every decision? <laughs> That's really weird. Every decision in regards to you. Oh, in regards to me. Why? Why? Would you really want to be the boss of anybody? Yeah. Oh, come on. Come on. I love telling you what to do. I, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're right. You're right. Kids. Women should be the boss of kids. <gasps> oh, no. Oh, no, you did not. Like school moms <laughs> or, or, or stay-at-home moms and stuff like that. Yes. That makes sense. Do you know what I'm the boss of? <laughs> Your vagina? Yes, sir. <laughs> That is correct. Oh, the open and close sign on it. And guess which way that sign's pointing right now. <laughs> oh my goodness! I thought it was, I thought for me it was like one of those um, old west saloon doors where it just <laughs> goes both ways. <laughs> You're such a weirdo. Uh, anyway, you know I'm joking. I do. Um. Okay. So then, with the teenagers now. Um, the girl that Brian Krakow Crackhead. was going to date and yeah. then decided that he couldn't because he liked Angela. Right. Likes Ricky. Yeah, she's got a crush on Ricky. And good old Ricky. It's kind of like weird. <laughs> it is weird. Because she you know, like everyone's talking about it like you would in high school, but everybody's right. like Oh, hey, Ricky, she really likes you. And Ricky's like, oh, man, if only I, you know, if only I liked girls, right. uh, this could be my chance to be 
He says this is going to be my chance to be normal. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty emotionally powerful stuff in the episode, actually. Like, Now, I think he said he was bi. At yeah. The beginning, at in the, the very beginning, the, he did. In the first episode. And I think they quickly kind of, they either decided, no, he's not bi, or they're going with the storyline of, you know, he kind of says he's bi to to ease people into the fact that he's just gay. Yeah. Because it really seems like he's just gay. He's only, when it, when he's talking about crushes or, or people he thinks cute, that are cute, he's only ever talked about guys. Well, and what he says to her when they finally talk about it, mm-hmm. he says, you know, well, he says to who, to somebody else, like, how much easier my life would be if I could only like her back. She said this, says that to Crackhead. Because yeah. Crackhead comes and, and tells him about it. And then when he's talking to her specifically, he's like, if I liked girls, mm-hmm. you know, I would like you or something like that. Well, he asks her out. He says, hey, do you want to go to the movie sometime or something like that? And she's like, yeah, you know, that'd be fun. And he says, because I, I think we'd be really good together or whatever. And he's, he's all nervous and everything when he's saying it. It's kind of cute, honestly. It's really good acting from the actor, too. Yeah. And um, she's like, but aren't you gay? And he's like, oh, um, yeah, you know. And then he does say, he's like, I've never really said it yeah. out loud to anybody. So I guess the bi was kind of like, like his way of just being like, you know, oh, I'm not all the way. Like he, you know, he's trying to ease out of the closet, I guess. Yeah. I mean, um, that was basically him coming out of the closet right there. Yeah. So she's like, you know, I got a crush on you. You know, it's funny because, you know, you're gay. Like, I know you, you can't like me back. But, you know, I think you're just so sweet and a good dancer and stuff like that. So it really looks like they're going to become friends. Yeah. Well, I think I think she said, too, it's like safe. It's a yeah. safe crush. Yeah. Because well, she, she knows nothing will happen. She talks about She's like, yeah, because, you know, you're much better than Brian uh, Krakow, who, who uses women <laughs> and then tosses them aside as if he's some sort of fucking ladies' man. Right. And he's just a whiny dork. <laughs> oh, crackhead. And, um, okay, so Krakow and Jordan. Yeah. They're tutoring. Yeah. And... So Cyrano de Bergiac situation yeah, going on there. Yeah, Jordan, like, wants to talk to Angela, but he can't figure out what to say. He wants and, her back. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it start, I think that's what it started with was a dream that mm-hmm. Angela was having about... That's right. Yeah, about him and, and how she yells at him. <laughs> And, you know, she has all the right things to say. Mm-hmm. And then in real life, she could never think of anything to say. And he goes up and tries to talk to her yep. at school in real life. And she's completely ignoring him. And he's just talking at her forever. Yeah. He's like, oh, you know, the band's got a new name and stuff. And... Yeah. Like bullshit. Nothing important. Right. Just small talk. And finally, she's like, why are you talking to me? Mm-hmm. So he's he's then he's lamenting to uh, Krakow. Mm. about how he wishes he knew what to say to her and stuff. And so then he somehow convinces Krakow to write him a letter to give to her. Well, first, because, like, Krakow's talking to him, and he's like, basically, they're having a conversation. He's like, well, dude, you know, you you you, uh, you built your own prison, mm-hmm. and now you've got to live in it and all this stuff. He's like, oh, it's really good. Right. He's like, I, I should say that to her. And then he's like, no, no, you know, we're not going down this way. And he's like, come on, you know, like, uh, to, and I think... Krakow gets kind of gets off on like Ricky calls him out that he's using Jordan to kind of say what he really feels about Angela, which is true. I think that's the the appeal for him. And obviously right. Jordan is trying to convey, you know, what he feels, but he can't, you know, he's not a wordsmith. So he goes up to Angela and basically says what Jordan said, you know, like about the prison and everything. And he's like, you know, maybe I I subconsciously wanted to, to hurt you and, and everything. And that's why I did it and everything. And she's like blown away. Oh, yeah. And she's like, oh, my God, you know, uh, we really need to talk now. And he's like, uh, well, I thought we just did. You know? Yeah, he's all panicked. Like, so he, run- to say. he runs away. The, for the first time in his life, he's like, well, I got to get to class. Right. And, um... <laughs> So he leaves, and that's when he says to Krakow, he's like, you know, I need you, like, I need you to write me a letter, and that's, you know, that then Krakow does. And it's an amazing letter. Yeah. 
And it like when when we actually hear the letter, I'm I'm just like, wow, he's like a passionate little dude. Like you would mm-hmm. not expect him to have those kind of intensive feelings. Right. But he's talking about like going to hell for her and like all kinds of stuff. So Yeah, it's 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 an interesting uh it's an interesting little letter. I wish that like I would have written it down so we could read it right now. Yeah, no kidding. Because, I mean, I really feel like if, if anybody missed the episode, they should hear it. But anyway, um, you know, she she is completely smitten now. Mm-hmm. And she wants to, you know, be with Jordan again. Yep. And what? how does it happen? Like, is it, cra- who says it's it? Ricky. Ricky. Ricky basically, so Ricky finds out that Jordan, or that, uh, Krakow wrote the letter for Jordan. Yeah. And I think Krakow basically just tells him. Yeah. And he's like, you know, hey, you know, and, you know, this isn't right or whatever, what you're doing and stuff. And so he he's like, you should tell Angela or, you know, I'm going to have to tell her. And anyway, so he does go up to Angela after she gets the letter and she's talking about it and everything. And she's like, you know, you figured out like Brian wrote it right. Like, you know, that that. Jordan could never have written this. And she plays it off. She's like, oh, yeah, of course. You know, of course. If he's like, oh, good. You know, he's like, I, I don't feel so bad about telling you now. He's like, <laughs> I, I was hoping that you had figured it out on your own. And it's just kind of like a safe face thing for both of them. Right. Um, But then, you know, obviously you can tell she's kind of disappointed that, uh, you know, Jordan didn't write it. And, you know, who knows where it would have gone from there. Um, Because yeah. you could, you know, maybe she could start to see uh, Brian in a different way. Maybe she, you know, gets mad at Jordan, but like Jordan explains to her, like, well, these, these are the things I feel. I just, you know, I don't have these words, you know, kind of thing. But I don't think she was ever going to say anything. Like at the end of the episode, Mm -hmm. she confronts Krakow Mm -hmm. and they're kind of having like a a moment. Mm -hmm. And then Jordan comes and takes her away in his car. Yeah. Like I didn't, I didn't get the impression that she was gonna be like, oh, "Fuck you, Jordan." I get. The, I mean, maybe she's gonna fuck Jordan, but I get the impression that, that there was gonna be a love triangle. Thing well, going there's on. been a love triangle. It's just but she's I mean, finally a, aware of it. I mean, a serious one, though. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I don't really think there's anything between her and Jordan aside from physical attraction. Well, so far, yeah, I agree. And with. Krakow, I mean, they, like, grew up together, so she can't really look at him that way. <laughs> what? Um, oh, you're about to sneeze. Okay. Yeah, we, we, we got a little bit of the uh, sniffles from changing climates, because, again, we were in Florida. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I don't think she'd end up with Krakow, but... I don't know. Maybe. We'll never know we'll now. We'll never know. Unless we call up the writers and, and ask them where they were going. What their ideas right. were, and basically, like, not much happens with Rayanne this episode. Not yeah, they they're clear. They were clearly saving Rayanne up for something else, right. but yeah, Rayanne talks to uh, the other chick, uh, Juicy Wetness, uh, <laughs> or Juicy Sweetness, yeah. or whatever. Um, and like they kindle their friendship. Yeah, they decide to be friends because Rayanne's like lonely. She's like sitting in the bathroom mm-hmm. by herself and. Talking about how she doesn't have any friends, and Sharon's like, "Oh yeah, I'm your friend, basically." Yeah, so, yeah. But yeah, that's the that's the episode, the last episode ever, with so much up in the air of a so called life. Do you wish? Do you wish that they'd never made it so that you wouldn't have the questions, or no? Is it worth the enjoyment that we've had? I think it's worth it. I mean, it was definitely it was a good show. I think. You know, the the critics loved it. Uh, like, it got great reviews in every paper, TV guide, like, all over the place. Uh, fantastic reviews. It just apparently just didn't get the audience. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think... I mean, I honestly think Claire Danes will probably do some other things. And if this introduced the world to her, and this is like a stepping stone for her to go on and do other you know, acting work. I think that's worth it for sure. Well, yeah. Um, and you know, I, I, I enjoyed the show. Uh, it sucks that we're not going to get a resolution to, you know, anything, but I don't know who knows. Maybe, 
uh, maybe they'll make books or uh, comic books or something like that. Maybe. Sometimes they do that with uh, different properties, like um, they'll make uh, books or comic books about them to continue on. Like, it, there's an interesting story about uh, Star Wars. So before Star Wars came out, um, before the first one came out, George nineteen seventy seven seventy seven. That's right. Yeah, George Lucas commissioned. Um, oh, I can't think of his name off the top of my head, but, uh, he's like a famous, like, no, like, uh, novelizing movies writer. Like okay. he, he's done a ton of, them. but anyway, he commissioned him to write a book sequel to star Wars in the event that star Wars flopped Okay, because George Lucas was worried that, it was going to fail because no one understood what he was doing. It was like the first like big uh, like special effects movie. Mm-hmm. So a lot of it wasn't there when they were filming. It all you know got put into post, you know, and stuff. Right. So a lot of the people on the set, the actors, the producers and stuff were like, what is going on? And like, this is, <laughs> you know, like, this is madness kind of thing. So like he was convinced that, you know, it might fail. Um, so he he, you know, commissioned him to write this novelization of the book, and I think there was a a comic commissioned from it too, I believe. Um, and there was like no Han Solo in there because they were like, you know, if this flops, he's you know we're not going to be able to get him back. And and there was like, uh, you know, less uh, like space fights and stuff like that. Just stuff like you know, we we'll, we could make a really low budget movie based on this novelization uh, as a sequel, if you know, no studio will give us money basically kind of thing. <laughs> um, so yeah, that like, that's that, that makes, it makes me think of that. Like maybe someone will do something like that, even if they're not going to rekindle this show at, at all. Um, uh, maybe they'll do like a book or a comic book or something. Maybe, uh, maybe, maybe we should write a book. Really? Yeah. Okay. We could, we could write the conclusion of my so-called life. All right. All right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, right on that. Right? So, I'm exhausted today, and the reason I'm exhausted today is because he made me go to the super duper late late show. Oh, I thought it was the uh I thought it was the Batwing Western Doors. Oh my god. <laughs> oh, sorry, uh, you were exhausted. You wish. <laughs> yeah. But we went and saw a movie and I'm not sure on it. Okay. I mean, I'll it, go I'll go through the plot if you want and okay. you can give your your feelings on it. All right, well so we saw the Mouth in, of Madness in the Mouth, in the of, mouth madness. of Madness. In the Mouth of Madness starring Sam Neill, New Zealand's own Sam Neill. Uh, uh, well, I Ireland and New Zealand's own Sam Neill. Uh and Charlton Heston uh, plays a role in it and then some other losers. <laughs> Um, but basically it's the, it's like an amalgamation of Stephen King and H.P. Lovecraft, in my opinion. Um, it's John Carpenter movie. So Halloween, uh, you know, uh, the thing, you know, you know, John Carpenter, uh, and his track record. Yeah. Um, so, you know, he did the movie. It's, I liked it. Um, I guess I'll give you my thoughts on it afterwards, but basically, the not the main character because Sam Neill's the main character, but there's a right. I'll just go from the beginning. So okay. <laughs> Sam Neill plays an insurance investigator, and at the beginning we get his bona fides right away, where he correctly ascertains that uh, a guy that owned a warehouse set a fire on purpose to burn down his his warehouse to get collect the insurance money and a lot of the stuff that was supposedly lost in the warehouse, uh, furs and and jewelry and stuff like that, uh, appeared on both his wife and his mistress. (laughs) Um, Oops. Yeah, exactly. So we get, we get Sam Neill's bona fides right away that he is good at detecting bullshit. And one of the, uh, you know, one of the, actually, I think he was in the movie soul man. Um, but, uh, I think he was one of the professors in soul man, but, uh, this actor, he, tells him that he they have a claim because Sam Neill's works freelance. Um, and so he goes to different insurance companies and investigates claims for them. Well, this guy's got an insurance claim 
from a publishing house that their star writer, Sutter Kane, has gone missing. And apparently, I guess they've insured Sutter Kane. Uh, I don't know if that's a common practice. Yeah, that's really for, weird. For writers or... I, I assume maybe what they're doing is ensuring the work, the writing, right. but it that also seems weird uh, to me. I don't know. Uh, maybe Stephen King, if you want to write to us, uh, late fee nineteen ninety four at at aol dot com because I assume you listen. Um, you know, your name checked a couple times in this movie. Uh, I think John Carpenter he directed Christine. I think he knows Stephen King a little bit. Mm, okay. Um, you know, John Carpenter might talk to Stephen King uh, in between the thousand cigarettes that he smokes a day. Uh, I don't know if you, I don't know if you're aware of this, but John Carpenter is a very enthusiastic smoker. Well, that explains all the smoking in this movie. Um, there's a there's a scene in Halloween where you can see a wisp of smoke go into the camera and it's like Carpenter just like standing next to the camera watching and it's the wisp of his smoke. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. He's, uh, he likes, he likes his cigarettes, but anyway, um, so, uh, like I said, he's name checked a couple times, but Mr. King, if, if your publishing company, I believe you're at random house, uh, if your publishing company has an insurance on you in some way in case you die or, or whatever. I mean, maybe if like, so like big authors will sign like, like two and three book deals or like four book deals or something like that. Maybe those are insured. Whereas if the writer dies or for some reason can't complete the contract that the company can get recoup some of that money or something like that. Maybe. That makes sense. But anyway, so he's gone missing and Charlton Heston's the head of this publishing company and he wants uh, either Sutter Kane back or his new book, In the Mouth of Madness. Uh, like I said, they mentioned Stephen King a few times. The way Sutter Kane's name is printed on the books is basically the Stephen King font. Right. Uh, the, like the font that Stephen King's name appears in on every book that he's done. Uh, Sutter Kane, Stephen King, it's the same sounds. But as far as what he writes about and the subject matter, it's very much H.P. Lovecraft. Very much. Yeah. And uh, Lovecraft wrote a book called At the Mountains of Madness. So this title is obviously a very uh, thinly veiled reference to Lovecraft. Uh, and, and it's, you know, it's basically, you know, like they're, they're taking the Stephen King persona of like a modern, very successful horror writer that has a legion of, you know, devote fans. But the stuff that he writes about is not Stephen King type stuff. It's, it's Lovecraft type stuff. And that's the horror in this movie is Lovecraftian type horror where it's it's a lot of monsters, like weird tentacly monsters, and it's a lot of what's real and what's not real and are you going fucking insane kind of stuff. And that, that's what a lot of what Lovecraft dealt with, and that's what a lot of this movie deals with. So they want Sam Neill to find Sutter Kane or find the manuscript. Uh and because Sutter and like Sam Neill's investigating this thing, and he's like, I, you know, I think you're full of shit. Basically, so he says, like, I think this is a publicity stunt. I think you know exactly where Sutter Kane is. I think you want me to go and try to find him, and it's like a contest or whatever. And somehow, this is one of the scenes that like isn't fully fleshed out, or one of the ideas isn't fully fleshed out, and I don't really love. Mm. He t he gets all these books. Sam Neill gets all the books from Sutter Kane. Hobbs End Horror, and I don't know, there's a bunch of other ones. Uh -huh. And he's looking at the covers, and then he's like, oh, let me take these scissors and cut it. Like, yeah. And it's like he cuts them out in random. Like, I don't know what he's cutting out. Is he cutting out the artwork? Like, it, like it, because it, it doesn't look like he's only cutting out the pictures. Right. If it looked like he was only cutting out the pictures, and then they fit together like a puzzle, that would have made more sense. But he's cutting out like the pictures plus a little bit of the of the rest of the book, you know, the front cover, and then he puts them together, kind of like overlapping and stuff like that. And it looks like he makes uh, New Hampshire because it's the state of New Hampshire. But it looks like he makes the state of New Hampshire out of it. Like like that was his goal, right? Was to do that, not like it fit together like a puzzle. It wasn't. It. it, it it just wasn't like the props and stuff just weren't right. Yeah, it was it was definitely poorly poorly put together. So there's a little red dot in the like the lower corner of New Hampshire, and you know he they 
for some reason, this is another thing that's silly. Hmm. He goes to the publishing company with uh, Styles, the the girl. Yeah, they they make they make him take her. They yeah they 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 named the female character after the friend in uh, Teen Wolf for some reason. <laughs> but anyway, Charlton Heston's there and Styles is there, who is supposed supposedly Sutter Kane's editor, and he's like, look, it's a map, and they for for whatever reason, <laughs> they just have a whiteboard. With like an outline in in uh, in ink or or like marker or something, a perfect outline of the Northeast with Maine and then Vermont and New Hampshire and Massachusetts, <laughs> and then like there's a plastic cover that goes over it and he puts the he puts what he made right into New Hampshire and then puts the plastic over it. He's like, look, it's a map, and it's like, why do they have that? Right. Why is that at the publishing company? Uh, it's so ridiculous. Yeah. But um, but anyway, so he's like, this is where he is in this little red spot. And it's like, he's like, oh, I get it. It's like a contest. And, so, and he still thinks it's bullshit. Right. Um, I should point out, I forgot to point this out, that the beginning of the movie is him getting taken to an insane asylum. Oh, yeah. And putting it put into a room. He wants to get out and everything. And then finally he's like, no, it's cool. You know, I'll be in here. And then David Warner from Star Trek uh, comes to see him. And he's been in some Star Trek movies. Uh, and he was in Star Trek uh, 5. And he was in, I think, Star Trek 2 or 3. Like, he played two different characters. But David Warner's uh, he's an actor that's been around, an uh, English actor, and he's been in a few Star Treks. So, um, or Star Trek, sorry. Okay. Um, and then, uh, <laughs> so he... He's a psychologist, and he's like, hey, you know, uh, tell me about it, dude. So the whole movie is him talking to David Warner. Right. Um, but, uh, oh, and he asked for a black crayon uh, beforehand, and he drew a bunch of, like, religious symbols and just shit, like, crazy shit Mostly over crosses. Yeah. Not um, just the walls, it's the body, too. Yeah. So, anyway. Oh, and I also forgot, when he's talking to the professor from Soul Man, uh, <laughs> this dude with an axe... <laughs> Like, in a very brilliantly shot, like, well-shot scene, there, it's framed perfectly. Uh, Sam Neill and the other character, are, or the other guy, are sitting at uh, a diner diner table on either side, and they're, they're, like, you know, on either side of the frame, and then in the middle of the frame, there's the window looking across the street, and you see the dude with the axe come across the street. People start running. Sam Neill and this other guy are still having a conversation, yeah. so it's like they don't know it's coming. We know it's coming, and it, the, the the camera slowly kind of pushes in to where they're at the very edges of the frame, and the, the majority of the middle of the frame is this dude walking across the street with an axe, and then eventually just like, you know, crashes through the window with his axe, looks at Sam Neill and says, do you read Sutter Kane? <laughs> and he's got uh, four pupils for some reason. It's really weird. And uh, Sam Neill, <laughs> in maybe the the one bad acting moment in the movie, Sam Neill just goes, what? Like, <laughs> it's so weird. And then he, the guy just kind of shrugs his shoulders and raises up the axe to kill Sam Neill. And then the cops, like, blow him away. Uh, Charlton Heston later tells him that was uh, Sutter Keynes' agent. <laughs> so... <laughs> He looked like, I don't know, like he was like a homeless crazy dude. He did not look like mm -hmm. an agent. Yeah. And it was a really weird way to like try to, to sell the books, you know, to attack people with axes and say, right? you read. <laughs> okay. Um, but anyway, so yeah, Charlton Heston says, Styles has got to go with you because I don't fully trust you either. Um, and he says, okay, you know, I already kind of have a crush on this girl uh, <laughs> anyway, so that's cool. So they drive to... They're driving to New Hampshire to the Red Dot, and Sam Neill's like, she's like, oh, well, it's going to be Hobbs End. And he's like, no, no, Hobbs End doesn't exist. He's like, but, um, you know, there's going to be something there. There's going to be right. some town there. So they're driving there, and Sam Neill falls asleep, and, and Styles starts driving, which I, I think is weird when we find out what we find out later. But so she's driving... And she sees this uh, this kid, like teenage kid, uh, drive you know uh, ride by on his bike, and then he comes back in the other direction, and he's like ancient, yeah, like incredibly old, 
with the same playing cards in the tire spokes. So right. I know it's the same guy. And eventually she runs into him because he like just keeps popping up. So she like runs into him with this car. Um, you know, they go and see and like Sam Neill's like, oh, go to blanket, you know, don't move, dude. And uh, the guy like stands up and he goes, uh, he won't let me leave. And then just gets on his bike and and rides away. Um, so, you know, and then at one point they're she's driving Sam Neill goes back to sleep, which is so weird. Right. After she hits another human being, um, at least from his perspective. And then she's driving and she looks down and there's nothing underneath them, just clouds and and lightning and shit like that. And then she's going over a covered bridge and then she's in Hobbs End. Mm-hmm. And it's daytime. Anything to say so far? Um, yeah, I mean, it's ridiculous. Like... I, I honestly thought they were dreaming or something. Like, it doesn't seem like so that would be real. you don't like the ending is basically what this comes down to. I, I don't like the ending, no. Okay. So, uh, anyway, they uh, to kind of, you know, make a long story short, because it's, it's a very in-depth movie, they, you know, they, they knock around Hobbs End, they run into a bunch of characters that Sutter Kane has written in, in other books of his, uh, Styles, the woman ends up getting taken over by some like tentacle Cthulhu monster. Uh, Sutter Kane himself appears. He's like, "Hey, you know, here's the book in the mouth of madness. Take this back. That's your job is to take this back. Uh, you're a character that I fucking wrote. Yeah, uh, you don't exist. Uh, you know, you you are one of my characters, and that's your your point. This that's your the point of view in the story is to take this back to the real world because." These monsters that I've written about actually exist, apparently. I didn't realize they did, but they do. And he was writing what they told him to write. Yeah, exactly. And he's like, so now I understand that my point, my the point of me is to is to write these stories and let people know that, you know, this is coming, that they're coming from this other dimension or or whatever, and your job is to take what I wrote and give it to the people. Almost like, and it's, you know, there is a lot of religious uh, connotations to this. You know, if you think about it, almost like Sutter Kane is God, and, uh, you know, Sam Neill is Jesus, almost like bringing the word to the people, you know, and everything, and these Cthulhu monsters are, I don't know, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. I Satan, mean, like... I guess. But but anyway, so they run, like I said, they run into a lot of people, including Vigo the Carpathian from Ghostbusters 2 for some reason. They get the person with the thickest accent that has ever lived to uh, play a to play a, a New England fucking uh, New Hampshire person. Like everyone else is like the, the talking with the. They're talking with the the New England accent, bah haba, you know. We're going to the, you know, and and he's like uh, Jenny boy. <laughs> it's right. so fucking weird, but anyway, um, so they run in all these people that are other that are also written. Uh, the dude, Johnny boy, dude, uh, blows his brains out, and Sam Neill tries to stop him, and he's like, oh, he wrote me doing this, so I can't do anything about it, right. and you know, he kills himself. And then, uh, so Sam Neill's like, well, you know, I, I gotta get out of here. And he basically does get out of there and goes back into reality. Basically. No, he runs down this long hallway mm-hmm. with the, the, the monsters, like, right at his heels. Right. And I don't understand how it's, like, a warning or whatever, because the monsters are right behind him. So, I'm sorry, but handing out the freaking you know, manuscript is not gonna do any good if the monsters are right behind him. Sorry. Well, I think the monsters are kind of taking their time. You know, they're like, they're slowly... And what are they doing? That They must be possessing people. Because what happens is, he goes to Charlton Heston and says, Hey, um, you can't publish this book. Like, this is horrible. I saw Sutter Kane. He ripped himself into a page of a book somehow. <laughs> and... It's really weird. And all these monsters are coming, and this is what he wants... We can't do this. This is going to drive people mad. And Charlton Heston's like, oh, I hope so. You know, the movie comes out next month or whatever. <laughs> he's like, and he's like, so you can't, you know, he's like, I had to destroy the manuscript. And he could, well, he says, he's like, you know, Styles got killed and stuff. 
And he's like, oh, yeah, Styles, the woman that you said I sent you with. He's like, but I know I sent you alone. So, like, she never went. She never right. existed, apparently. So, she never existed, but she did most of the driving. It's, I don't know, it's, that's weird, too. Um, well, I mean, if the car was, you know, floating in the air. Yeah, that's true. Was anyone driving? Uh, yeah, Sam Neill, Sam Neill explains it away as she was written out. Mm-hmm. That, that character was written out. So... And then Charlton Heston's like, oh, I know you didn't destroy the manuscript. He's like, I know that's not true because you turned it into me personally weeks ago. We published it. It's been on the shelves for three weeks. He gives them a fucking paperback copy, which is also weird to me. They pr- they produce hardback copies first. Right. Then like a year later, the paperback comes out. So yeah. I don't I don't know exactly what this publishing company is doing or it must be losing money. But anyway, <laughs> um. So he's like, here's the paperback, because uh, it's cheaper to print uh, for the movie, <laughs> of the thing. Like, you know, it's whatever. And it's weird. What's also weird is it's called In the Mouth of Madness, and it says with Alan Land or whatever his name is. or I can't John Land. John something. Um, but anyway, the characters, Sam Neill's character's name in the book, in, in, oh, in the man. movie. So it's like the Charlton Heston never thinks to himself, oh, this book is, you know, starring this fucking guy right. that I'm talking to. Like, he never puts that together. But apparently, anyone that reads this book goes nuts, like the the uh, agent at the beginning, and starts killing people and stuff. And it's an epidemic that's spreading all over the world. Uh, you know, we close back in on the, uh, the insane asylum. Um... You know, there are people on the radio saying like, hey, if you're one of the people that don't have this disease or whatever they're they're calling it, you know, this is where we're, you know, hold up and stuff. We're trying to, um, you know, be the last bastion of humanity or whatever. Uh, David Warner finishes up with them and he's like, you know, oh, fuck, you know, he's all fucked up and stuff. And then uh, he leaves. Yeah, that's his professional diagnosis. Yeah. And then he leaves and you vote. It's it looks like there's a passage of time. You know, uh, and there's Cthulhu monsters in the, the insane asylum and the the door gets like burst open and Sam Neill comes out. He walks around. Everyone's uh, like, you know, everyone's whatever. Oh, he also killed a dude with an axe. That's why he get, got taken to the insane asylum right. because uh, he goes to the bookstore. This uh, guy comes out and he's like, hey, uh, you know, you like the book and stuff. And the guy looks at him and his eyes are all bleeding and stuff. And he goes, uh, he goes, yeah, it's awesome. He goes, okay, well, this will come as no surprise. And then he kills him with an, with an ax. Um, and then anyway, so at the end, that's basically it. Like Sam Neill walks out, he goes to see the movie in the mouth of madness, Mm -hmm. which is the movie we're watching. (laughs) And then he starts laughing and then it's the end. And, and then, he's the only one in there because, you know, everybody's freaking dead or insane or turned into monsters or whatever. Yeah. And then Carol said to me, do you think that was real? And I said, no, it's just a movie. <laughs> and I was like, "We just because we watched it, that doesn't mean monsters are actually coming. And she was like, no, no, no. She's like, do you think that Sam Neill was like, the, everything that he saw was real? You know, she's like, I thought it was going to be a dream or, or whatever. And I said, yeah. And my interpretation of it is, and I could be wrong because there There are multiple interpretations, I'm sure, of this book. But my interpretation of it is that Sam Neill is a character that Sutter Kane wrote. He was never a real person, but he was somehow able to interact with the real world, even though he was a character in a book. He was a character in a book come to life, basically. So was Styles, but Styles was written out. Charlton Heston was real. The agent was real. Other people that we saw in the actual real world were real. When he went to Hobbs end, that was also uh, fiction. Like all those people were created by Sutter Kane. Sutter Kane's fiction came, became reality. Basically Um, these other dimensional beings or whatever they are, were able to gain some kind of foothold. Uh, The movie is a lot about the, the nature of fiction versus reality and the nature of insanity and sanity. Uh, at one point, Styles says, hey, you know, if you, you know, you think you're sane, but if the insane became the majority, then you'd be in an insane asylum. Everyone would think you're crazy, <laughs> which I guess is true. 
Because, but I don't. I, I think there is a sane and insane. I, I don't think that's. Well, yeah. I don't think it's a matter of opinion. But, you believe in absolute truth, so. Yeah, I do. But anyway, so, um, yeah, I'm a Socratesian or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, so yeah, I mean, like I, that's my interpretation is that is that everything that Sutter Kane said was basically true. Now it could be that Sam Neill's just nuts and everything that he sees you know, is not real. Right. That he, you know, he went to this town. He didn't see anything really. He just made it all up in his brain after reading these books. Um, You know, he killed some dude with an ax and then they locked him in an insane asylum. And him walking out of the insane asylum is just him imagining that. Right. Like all this could be hallucinations from him because they said that Sutter Kane's books were so uh, disturbing that, you know, people experience hallucinations and, like, you know, all these other, like, things from it, right? So that's, and he read all of Sutter Kane's books, like, in one night. So that's possible. Uh, It's a possible explanation. I happen to think that everything that, that what the movie presented us was was what was real. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I kind of agree with your interpretation because... Usually, if they're alluding that things are imagined or a dream or whatever, they they do something a little bit more to let you know that. Yeah, there's some way that you can get into it. But um, you know, I'll, I'll be honest. Like the movie, I think is driving me a little insane. I had nightmares. Oh yeah. <laughs> like all night long. Like okay. I just kept waking up having nightmares about this stupid movie and the monsters and like being in Hobbs End and stuff. Okay. So that's why you think it's bad? Because it affected you? <laughs> well, I mean, obviously, okay, in some ways it's good because it was that scary. Mm-hmm. But it's not my kind of scary. Ah, yes. It's it's gross and disturbing. And, like, I like horror light. I like, like, Interview with a Vampire. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know? So you, I, you said you've never seen The Thing, 1982's right. The Thing. And I suggested we watch The Thing. Based on what you're saying, I don't think you'll like The Thing. Well, I'll still watch it. It's a classic, right? Like, Yeah. I, I mean... Th- there, it's... it's uh, there's a lot of what they call body horror. Oh, oh it's no, like, no, no. I don't like body horror. Where it's like gross kind of <laughs> stuff, you know? No, yeah. There's... I'll, t- I'll give you a spoiler. There's a famous scene where someone goes to shock uh, a guy... Uh-huh. Like to shock his chest, and the, there's a monster inside of him. Uh-huh. So the chest opens up and grabs this guy's arms, and like it clamps down like it's a mouth, and the guy's arms come off like his like his hands come off uh-huh. basically. So that's like that's the kind of body horror that because the the plot of the thing is there are people in in in, in Ar- Antarctica in a research station. Uh, um, What's his name? Uh, uh, Kurt Russell is the star of it. So there's a bunch of scientists there, and you know, in this in this research station, and an, an alien pod lands. They don't know this, but an alien pod lands, and a creature gets out. We never see the creature, but the nature of this creature is that it can basically infect and then mimic anybody. It, it starts with dogs, it, like a like a couple dogs. And then it kills somebody else. That's what it's doing. It's like killing people. It kills somebody else and like takes takes like their form, right? Um, the only way you can tell is if you cut like their arm open, like it's like green ooze or something comes out instead of blood, right? Okay. Um, but that's the plot of it. So that like it's slowly killing people one by one and then taking them over, and they never know who who's the monster and who, right. who isn't. You know. So that's the that's kind of the the main plot of the thing, uh, so that's why there's a lot of like body horror type stuff. But it was it's all practical effects, and a lot of it still really holds up. I mean, like there's a lot of things in this movie mm-hmm. that didn't. I mean, like it didn't look good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like there was the one scene where. The girl, what's her name again? Styles. Styles. Like contorts herself all around, like like you know. I've seen mm-hmm. them do in like possession movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, the way that her head was twisted, it you could tell it was like 
silicone like attaching her face to Mm -hmm. this thing like it was not well done so here's the problem they're starting this this stuff this the with computers now where they're doing a lot of special effects that they used to do uh where they'd make models or or stuff like that they're starting to do a lot of it with computers now um, like Industrial Lights and Magic, which is uh, George Lucas's special effects house and stuff like that, they're starting to do more with computers to uh, make like because on computers, you know, there's like paint, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, obviously the programs they're making are much more sophisticated than that, but there are things on computers now where you can make basically like you could build like a like a skyline, right? right. So they're they're finding ways to do that and then project that or whatever, put it somehow onto the film um, so that it's the computers making these special effects. So we're at a transition phase right now. And a lot of the people that are, that are really talented that are going into special effects are these people that are, they're into computers and stuff. And we're passing by an era of like, you know, uh, Harry Housen and like, um, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones, uh, like Baker and some of the other people that, uh, are really good practical special effects people, like people that worked on the thing and stuff like that, or, or, you know, some of the ones that worked on star Wars, um, where they, you know, they're really good at, at doing matte paintings or, or making, you know, rear projection or, you know, whatever, like models and stuff like that. So, a lot of I've noticed when a movie needs special effects now, they're not spending the top tier on the best people to do it. So it looks a little janky. Yeah. And I think um, I think that's what's going on with this movie. I think that's what's going on with a lot of movies. And I think they're putting a lot more emphasis on the computer stuff because I think everyone kind of well, I mean, not everyone. But I think people in the industry sort of think that that's where the future of doing it is because it's cheaper. To, to make it all on a computer as opposed to like get buying all these materials and stuff. Hmm. Okay. I mean, I guess, but I still, I still think it wasn't, it, they didn't sell it. It didn't look great. I they agree. didn't sell it. I knew, I knew it was fake mm-hmm. for a lot of the things, but when they did sell it, it was so freaking horrifying. Oh yeah. There was a few, there were a few special effects that were really good. Right. Yeah, I, I'm just hoping that I don't have more nightmares. <laughs> so, did you like it or didn't you like it? I don't. You said know. you're mixed. I mean, like, like I said, I mean, it's if it, it was scary, which was the movie's job. So it was, you know, it did it. What didn't you like but, about it? Well, like I said, I didn't like the way it looked. Mm. I didn't like like the kind of horror it was. Like the right. scene where like they're chopping people up and you see them like eating the flesh off an axe. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, and like the, there was scenes with like kids, and they look like like they're like turning into Monsters. like zombies or whatever. Yeah. And, oh, it was terrible. Like just, I mean, I don't like things with kids. Um, I I just and I didn't like. I would have liked it more if it wasn't supposed to be real because it was so unbelievable. Which I know you know the suspension of disbelief, but I couldn't. I guess it's true. So. John Carpenter's made three movies now where basically the world is ending. So the thing is one, I guess that's one interpretation of it is that this thing can't be stopped, uh, you know, in the thing. And then eventually it's going to go from Antarctica and spread all over the world. That's not, that's not exactly my interpretation of it, but that's what people are saying is that, you know, it's kind of like, that's a a way the world could end basically an alien alien invasion of this nature. Okay. Um, in 1987, he made a a movie called Prince of darkness, uh, which is basically, uh, this Donald Pleasance finds this green ooze or whatever. And it turns out that it's the essence of Satan and it starts to seep out. Um, and then just kind of like invade, like the world, you know, mm-hmm. um, and that's another way the world could end. It's much more religious and biblical kind of uh, Armageddon story. And then this is, uh, I guess, if you want, if it's if it's a trilogy, he might make more of these. Who knows? But um, uh, you know, this would be the third one, the third. And I think I 
agree with your point, although it's weird because they're all kind of fanciful things. Uh But I agree this is probably the most unrealistic of the, you know, like the possible Armageddons because I don't, I, I am a writer and I like to write uh, and I like to read books and uh, fictional worlds have a certain charm and realism to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and my, the characters that I write have a certain realism, uh, to me as well. But do I think that it's ever going to be possible that someone will write something that then becomes real and, <laughs> and infects the real world? No, I don't no. think that will ever happen. <laughs> I don't think that's a possible thing to happen. I think there's a very, there might be a fine line, but I think it's a very definite line between, uh, what is real and and what is not real? Yes. Um. And I don't think that fictional worlds will ever come into the real world. And uh, I don't think that. So, for instance, I don't think that when I write something, that the people I'm writing actually exist in some alternate dimension. Right. I think it's an interesting idea for a story, and it's an interesting way to talk about the nature of fiction and the nature of reality. And the fine line in the relationship between those two things, which I think was one of the things this movie does really well. Um, but I don't think that it's actually realistic. Right. An alien possibly could come and invade the Earth, I suppose, because, I mean, you know, obviously I don't think there's any ev- I haven't seen any solid evidence that aliens actually exist. But given the vastness and the almost infinite nature of the universe and how many planets and solar systems and stars there are out there. I think it's, I mean, I think there has to be life somewhere else. It could it ever get here. Maybe. And if it did, could it be hostile? Maybe. And would it want to try to take us out? Maybe that's a lot of maybes. It is a lot of maybes. And, and the, the, the odds might be really small, but I think they, ex- I think the odds exist as a number greater than zero. Okay. I think that uh, the odds of a fictional world coming becoming reality is zero. What about the odds of somebody stumbling upon the essence of Satan? I, you know, that's I we we don't we try not to talk about politics. We try not to talk about religion <laughs> on the show. So I mean, it depends on what your on what your belief is as far as religion goes. If you believe that there is a God and a Satan, uh, then there's obviously a less than zero chance that, right. that in that somehow Satan could, you know, be released or, or whatever and uh, onto the earth. And that's the beginning of, of, you know, the end times like, uh, that's, you yeah. know, if you believe, if you, if you, be, if you have faith that God exists, then that exists as a less than zero possibility. Yeah. I mean, I agree. I think this is, that's part of the problem with the movie is that it's just too far out there. But I don't think it needs to be taken as a serious thing that could happen. It's like zombies. Like, I think there's a zero chance that like night of the living I dead, I don't think it's like zero. night of the living dead. Right. I, I think there's a 0% chance that that could happen because all that is, is a literal interpretation of, you know, another biblical thing. The, you know, the dead rising at the end of the world. That's a, it's a literal interpretation of that. But uh, I don't think that that's something that could ever happen, that the dead could actually reanimate and attack people and then infect people with something that also makes them into a zombie. Like, I just I don't I, I think that has a zero chance of happening, too. But that doesn't stop me from enjoying Night of the Living right. Dead or, or Day of the Dead or, or whatever. I, I I can take this movie as simply this is a movie. It doesn't I can suspend my disbelief. It doesn't matter that, that this is never going to happen kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, I can usually suspend my disbelief, but I just couldn't for this one. I think that the the filmmaking techniques uh, put it a little above the above the rim too to me. Like there's a lot of really great framing in this movie. There's a lot of you know there there are a lot of innovative shots. There's the, the kind of the the way that the the way that the camera pans on the insane asylum when everything's nice and and the world is still exists as we know it when Sam Neill's being brought in at the beginning. It kind of pans in a circular motion around the um 
the ambulance that's bringing him there and everything's like nice and neat, right? When he gets out of the insane asylum, it pans from the exact opposite direction from the building back out. And, you know, the uh, the ambulance is abandoned. There's papers everywhere. It's clear that the world is in ruins. That's a brilliant, f- you know, framing device and shot of, you know, the beginning of the film, the end of the film, and, and what has transpired in the time we've been watching, uh, you know, the movie oh, in yeah. the world. So I think there's a lot of really great filmmaker techniques. John, John Carpenter obviously knows what he's doing. As far as far as making a movie goes, and I think there's a lot of really good artistry on display in this movie, and, I, and that to me also kind of elevates it. For sure, uh, the camera work was excellent, and you know the beginning and the end, and you know the way that they shot it was mm. awesome. And if the middle didn't, you know, have so <laughs> much uh, fake looking and just horrifying stuff, we'd be good. But still, it still emotionally affected you, which it is what a movie's supposed night. to do. All night. But that's what I'm saying. That's what a movie's supposed to do. Yeah. So, Like I said, I mean, it did its job, but I wouldn't say I enjoyed it. All right. Well, I guess that is the show. Is that the show? That's the show. Is that what we do for the show? <laughs> I don't know. It's been too long, people. All right. Well, take us home. All right, so, you know, give us the stars and, um, you know. Star, a star. <laughs> tell your friends and, mm-hmm. you know, write us at yep. latefee1994 at AOL.com. Yeah, tell your friends. Uh, you know, Carol's Locker for for donations. If you want to donate to the show, keep us going. Help us buy those movie tickets. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, if you want to... Uh, send some some feedback or, or visit us somewhere you can go to my locker that's all you know you can find that in the liner notes or, or whatever <laughs> tell us if there's anything you want to see yep or anything or you near, want us I to mean. see anything you want us to hear any of that stuff yeah do it do it bye bye <laughs>